Where is there? Someone has a question? Etienne? Yes, sir. Morning. Um, so I'm yet to be in a group, sir, as you know, so I got access last week. So would we address that now or after the class? After. So let's um so you're saying you're not in a group? Yes, sir, not in a group. All right, <clears throat> for those of us who are early, good morning again to everyone. Let's get started. Today, we are going to be looking at project communications management, as well as the half of uh, project scope management. So we are going to be looking at both with the understanding that um, at our next outing, we will um, complete um, project scope management. Now, I think the next outing will be tomorrow. <clears throat> if you look at Moodle, you will recognize that I've already indicated all the classes that we will be having for, the, for this month. And that's how I'm going to be doing it. So I will not be sending out emails um, with the link, all the links are on, um, all the classes already created for the month of, of uh, February. So please be um, following, following the information page. Okay. Now, when we think of project communication management, there are a number of things that come to mind. But there are three main areas that we need to focus on. Uh, we need to focus on planning. So we need to plan communication. Whilst we start the execution of the project, we need to be managing communication. And certainly throughout the project, we will be monitoring and controlling. So there has to be a mechanism for us to control communication. So that's a preamble. So there are three communications management processes, right? And then there is also the communications management plan. At the end of the session on communications management, we should at least be fully familiarized with what the three um, processes are and also what constitutes a communications management plan. So, it is said that 90% of an effective project manager's time is spent communicating. Interestingly, 50% of the 
of that time is reportedly spent with his team. And what is it that they do? They analyze um, communications and requirements. In addition to that, that information which they would have gathered or information that they must impart to stakeholders, they distribute that information. And the important element of the distribution of information is that it must be done accurately and on time. So they inform stakeholders of the project performance throughout the life of the project. So these are important um, not notation. Now, there is the Merabian rule of communication that I must familiarize you with. What the Mer and this study was done way back in, two, um, in 1967 and again validated by a group of scientists in 2012. So essentially what the Merabian rule of commun communication suggests is that 55% of that which we communicate is by way of body language. 38% of what we communicate is by the use of tone. And only 7% of what is communicated is by way of the spoken word. So my fear, if we are to believe that this rule, which is the Arabian rule, holds true today, my question therefore is, with this online communication that we are now having, to the extent that persons are paying attention, what percentage of that which I am communicating to you is actually being communicated to you? The fact that there is no body language to interpret and there is no tone of voice. Well, there is tone of voice, but sometimes tone of voice comes with that visual uh, interpretation of the expression as well, helps to determine our tone of voice. So yes, you are hearing me, and uh, we can say that we have had the telephone for many, many decades uh, now, and so persons would have used the telephone, for example, to communicate and in that sense would not be seeing the individual yet communication took place. But nonetheless, we can argue those points, but nonetheless, um, the Merabian Mer rule of communication is something, um, a, a requirement um, of our understanding based on the PIMBOK. Now, the, in terms of project communications management, the classical definition uh, that is given is that it's about the planning, collection, creation, distribution, storage, retrieval, management, controlling, monitoring, and the ultimate sharing of project information. That is what project communications management is. We should recognize there are, that there are some dimensions of communication, and we want to have a quick look at what these are. So let's start by looking at the different types of communications that you could experience on your project, right? From a project perspective, go ahead, Romain. Um, sir, morning, sir. Sorry for the interruption. Um, so, uh, it was approved for the court, we're still not seeing it in a module so he doesn't have the link to access the class. Sorry, go again. Can you repeat? Person who was up. Are you hearing me, sir? Yes, go ahead. All right, so a person who was approved to do the module, he doesn't have access to Moodle, so he's not having the link to for class. So I'm not sure if you could send a guest link so that he could access. All right. Um Please do not interrupt me for matters like those whenever I'm running a class. If you have questions pertaining to the subject matter, stop me at any time. On administrative matters, whilst the class has started, please do not disturb the class. That person who, I'm not going to stop the class to, to get off Moodle to go and send a link. I'm not going to do that, right? Because, because everybody knows 
I sent out an email week upon week to say that the links are on Moodle. What he could have done is to engage one of you guys to send him the link from early. So don't stop me during a class to be asking me to send a link. I'm not going to do it. I started the class deliberately 10 minutes late. So had this request come in that 10 minutes, then I could have sent the link. The fact I've started the class, please do not disrupt the class unless you are asking, you are making a contribution to what we are discussing or you are asking questions and that I'm obliged to answer, okay? All right. Um, so you can send him the link. You are online, so you can um, take, um, download the link and send it to him. So as I was saying, we have various dimensions of um, communication. Um, and we'll start <clears throat> by looking at the different types of communication in projects. The first is, let, let us look at um, um, project perspective. From a, a project perspective, uh, we can have what is referred to as internal communication, where we are communicating um, within the project team. And then there is external communication, which may require some amount of communication with external parties and bearing in mind that, that this would primarily be with um, stakeholders. We will recall that a stakeholder is anyone who can impact our project or who can be impacted by um, our project. So in this sense, when we are doing the communication, what we refer to as external uh, could be interpreted in various ways. So it is for the project manager having determined who the stakeholders are to then make a distinction between internal and external communica um, communications to uh, various stakeholders, or to make a distinction between those stakeholders who are perceived to be internal to the project and those that are external to it. From an organizational perspective, within an organization, communication can take place um, in what is referred to as a vertical communication. So in a sense, um, top down or bottom up, that is vertical communication. Then there's what is referred to as horizontal communication. And that um, communication uh, in a sense is looking at your peers, perhaps those at a similar level and you have, let's say you might have an organization with uh, managers, you have executive management, you have middle managers, and then you have line staff. The communication could be amongst managers only. So that would be considered to be horizontal um, communication. Then there is what is referred to as diagonal communication. And that um, could range from uh, top to bottom, bottom to top, but across um, in the form of a diagonal um, passing through middle man management rather than just um, a top down or a bottom of which would be vertical. All right, so there is a perspective of formality, right? When we talk about um, formal communication, formal communication is normally um, of the written type. Uh, nowadays, uh, the email in some quarters is being recognized as formal communication in some jurisdiction. It is still recognized as informal communication. Informal communication could you you just be talking to a man, send him a WhatsApp or a text or send a message that is informal communication. And perhaps for critical elements on a project, you may not necessarily want to indulge in. So when we think of the various lines of communication that we could uh, come up across when treating with projects, the project manager is seen as the hub of the communication. He is, um, or she, is the center um, of it all. <clears throat> so that project manager is going to be communicating with senior management, is going to be communicating with his project team, is going to be communicating with the business partners, partners uh, with customers, with shareholders, with uh, regulatory agencies, uh, with suppliers, with everybody. So that project manager is the fulcrum, is the center of everything with, with respect to communications on the project. 
nothing is communicated unless it passes through project manager. And this is important for us to recognize. Now, <clears throat> with that said, with that said, uh, <clears throat> there are some elements, other elements of communication that we are going to get to that is considered to, they are considered to be critical when treating with um, project communications management. Now let us look at the various processes. Uh, 10 here, as you already know, um, this is a 10th um, knowledge area. It's only because it's chapter 10 in the PMBOK, right? <clears throat> and we have three communications processes. We have plan communications management, which obviously is undertaken at the point of planning. We have managed communications management, which is done during the execution phase. And of course, we are controlling communications. which comes under the process group of, um, of monitoring and controlling. So <clears throat> these are the three that we will quickly look at. <clears throat> the first, plan communications management. Obviously, whatever information we have from our project management plan, we are going to utilize that to our advantage. We are going to utilize our project charter. And then there is EEF and OPA, which is your enterprise environmental factor and your organizational process asset. There is the stakeholder engagement plan, plan as a part of the project uh, management plan. Obviously, you will need that. You will need the stakeholder register to assist in determining who your stakeholders are, what must be communicated to them, and when. So you generate your plan based on that um, information. There are various methodologies to use when communicating, but of course, the project manager must have some expertise that he or she will use to aid the communication process. We uh, typically, in project management, say we do a communication requirements analysis to ensure that we fully understand and appreciate that which must be communicated to the stakeholder. And of course, we can use various forms of technologies, um, different models, different methods. And the, 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 the project manager must, of course, exhibit um, interpersonal and the team skills because the environment may vary. There may be cultural issues that will have to be addressed. There are political um, issues that may have to be addressed. People have different styles of communication, and to that extent, there is some amount of versatility that is required on the part of the project manager. This is very important. And of course, the output of this process is that we have a communications management plan at the end of the day. That's the key output. So plan communication management is, in essence, the process of developing um, an appropriate approach and a plan for communi uh, communicating uh, project uh, data based on the needs of the stakeholder, the requirements of the stakeholder, and the available organizational asset. Now, it is important to pause here for a moment that you could be uh, managing a project and you have stakeholders who will say to you, because one, one size does not always fit all. You could have someone who says to you, and this is a critical stakeholder, and I know a case of an architect, and interesting that this person works at UTEC as well. This architect does not use a cell phone in 2021, well, up until 2020, when I last communicated um, with him on a project, he does not use a cell phone because he has a number of theories about what is it that um, cell phones do, separate and apart from causing the cancer to the brain. It, um, the, the Americans are tapping into all phone calls and knows your business, right? So he doesn't use a cell phone. Also, he doesn't use um, email. As far as information is concerned, every single email in his mind is routed through the US. The US knows what is happening and they collect your email. So it doesn't use a cell phone, it doesn't use the email. He says he uses a fax. He says the fax technology 
and they no longer keep up with the fax technology because 99% of the world is using, is using email. So he uses fax. So just think about it. How many persons know anyone who has a fax machine today? So as a project manager, if this man is a key stakeholder, you have to find a mechanism to communicate with him. He says he wants his documents by fax. So you have to determine his importance and relevance. And we, when we look at um, stakeholder management, we looked at the power interest grid when we did the stakeholder analysis. And after having done that, you have to look at how important this person is. Having done the analysis uh, to your project, and decide uh, what it is that you have to do to ensure that you can communicate with him. So that is an important aspect of your planning cycle, understanding your stakeholders and plan to meet um, their needs. So when we're doing the planning, you would have already done your stakeholder analysis and so you understand this, your stakeholder. So question could be asked, what is it that we need to communicate to our stakeholders? So we could communicate a number of things. The success or failure of the project um, in spurts or during the life cycle of the project, the status of individual deliverables, deliverables or the project itself. Um, problems that arise, you have to analyze them and be able to report on them. The risks associated with the project Right? You have to um, consistently be analyzing those risks to ensure that the strategies that you would have developed for risk maintenance are being preserved. Any issue that arises on a project, you have, to, you, you have to be fully conversant with that. Now, discoveries. Supposing, remember we said in the definition of a project management, uh, um, in the definition of, um, of, of a project, that it, it's a temporary endeavor um, that uh, has some uniqueness about it that outputs um, it, 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 it outputs either a product, a service, or a result. Remember we said that in, in the definition of what a project is. So this covers here in the sense that a, a, result, a result could be the output of an investigation or a research initiative that is so structured um, to be a project. And so the output would be a result. So you can have discoveries of um, sorts, um, but not just that. You could be implementing a project, which of course um, will be new because every project is, is unique. And whilst you're doing so, you'll, you'll have some discovery. It might be a discovery related to the process of implementation or are, are some output that you didn't anticipate. That's a discovery. Updates on resource utilization and availability. Wow. So uh, in an environment where you might have, and you will always have limited resources in project implementation, that is something that you might want to, let's say you have, um, it's a construction project and you have aggregates and the aggregates, um, these aggregates, in terms of your stock is being depleted because you are utilizing the resource. You want to be able to be consistent to report, hey, I've utilized 50% or 70% of um, that which I have in stock. I'm gonna be needing this to ensure you don't run out of, in, um, of material. You may make changes to your project and the, the, those changes may come with intended or unintended consequences. You have to report those. Right? You may you may doing an analysis and you recognize that there are issues from your project team. You want to report um, those. Um, your senior management team or your sponsor may be interested in other ideas or may be interested in 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 some of those things that will manifest themselves during project implementation. You have to report those. Um, the sponsor uh, may be open to hearing conflicting ideas, problems, and, uh, and even new ideas. It is said that for every good project, that our every good project should result in a new project. So as you go along, particularly for investment type project, um, they may want to hear from you um, what is happening, extent to which 
they will build and do. So there are a number of things that you may be called upon to report in project uh, in the during the execution of a project. So it's important that we understand the importance of this. So the, the communication management plan answers four questions um, or five questions for us. Um, essentially, who needs what information when this information is needed and the methodology or, the, or how will the, this information be communicated to them and by whom. So it's essentially what the project communications management plan um, answers um, for us. An important element in project communications management is what is referred to as a communication channels. We need to be very conversant with, with um, this formula. The, in determining the amount of communications channel on a project, the formula is a half n, n minus one. So please remember this formula because you will see it, you will definitely will be seeing it in tests, etc. What this formula does for, for you, a half n, n minus one, it determines the amount of um, the number of stakeholders and um, that are open in a communications channel. So let us put it in simple terms. U utilizing the formula, right? If, if I am speaking to, to the 18 persons online right now as a body, just call yourself one, and, and um, you and I are communicating. That is one communication channel that is open, utilizing this formula. Or if I'm speaking to just one individual, or you are speaking to one individual, the amount of communication channels that would be open would be equal to one. Bearing in mind, N is the number of um, stakeholders, right? So let us test it. There are 19 persons online. Who can do a quick calculation for me? Utilize, utilizing this formula, how many communication channels are open? Go ahead, Etienne. Sir, 171. You sure about that? Test, test it again. So, 152. Uh huh. Why, is, why are we getting so many answers? This is a simple mathematics, you know. Simple mathematics. Anybody else? Sir, I want seven to one me you get them. Yeah. Okay. One seven to one. One seven to one. For those persons who got it wrong, please, you can't get simple things like these wrong because you're gonna see multiple choice questions. That is a one, two, three thing. What is N? N is the number of per, um of stakeholders. We are 19 persons online. So 19 minus one is 18 that, right? 18 multiplied by 19 and divide that by two. How much you get? 171, sir. Yes, man. So those people who got it wrong, you can't get these things wrong at this level, all right? So just remember the formula because you're not gonna be given any formula in, in a test or an exam, all right? <coughs> so, so just imagine that you have a project, you're running your project, and there are 19 team members, or, or 19 stakeholders, small yeah, Sister, sir, Mr. Mm. Big, big girl, you need another way to get a pill. 
All right, you finish. Thank you. All right. So just imagine that there are 19 persons on your project. As um, on your project meaning 19 stakeholders. These are both internal and external stakeholders. And for each person, each person is essentially communicating to the other parties on the project. You notice what happens? You're going to have 171 different communication channels, communicating information, some of it which may be erroneous, some of it which may, be, uh, may lead to problems. You don't want that. So for that reason, the project manager must, from very early, determine the amount of communication channels he has um, on his or her project and manage that. You, and that's why you have to manage and control communication. And that's why in the graph I shared earlier, there's a, there's a slide, this, this particular slide, where I said the project manager is in the center. The project manager, he or she, plans, manages, and controls communication. You can't have everybody just communicating all sorts of information to everybody. That is going to be a nightmare for you as a project manager. So you have to run a tight ship and ensure that all communications are channeled through you, particularly those that are going out to external um, stakeholders. All right, you as a project manager must control the communication. All right, so we now know how to determine the amount of communication channels on our project. We also now know that it is critically important that we as a project manager control the communication, not anybody else. All right, so key to communication planning is to determine and limit who will communicate with whom and who will receive what information. As project manager, you have to control that. So, so, so again, here is the formula, a half N, N minus one. When two people are communicating, there is one communication channel open. If there are three persons communicating, there are three communication channels um, open. And just look, so each person is communicating. So this lady is communicating with these two, and each of them communicating with each other. You have only three communication channels open. But if you have four persons communicating with each other, you already have six communication channels. And as the numbers increase, it increases exponentially. We just calculated that 19 persons communicating with each other produce 171 communication channels, something you would not be able to manage as a project manager. So you want to ensure that you manage and control that even before the project starts. Okay. Now, when we think of um, planning communication management, there are various um, forms. I would have alluded to some of them before. In today's world, the, you know, techno, uh, technological advancement has in, improved the manner in which we communicate on projects. We can communicate face to face, which is uh, the, the, the oldest, perhaps the oldest means of communication. We can uh, use email, fax, telephone, video conference, social media, letters, memos, you name it. Our understanding should also expand to the different communication models that exist. So there are three main types of communication models, there are three types that we need to be familiar with. The linear type, the interactional type, and the transactional type, right? So let us have a quick look at the linear models um, that exist. So basically, the linear model explains a one-dimensional communication process. The first linear model that was crafted was crafted by Aristotle. So the Aristotle model of communication suggests that there is a speaker, uh, there is speech, 
obviously, if there's a speaker um, of importance, is a recognition of the audience and the effect. The effect, of course, is 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 um, observed at the end. There's what is known as the Berlow SMCR model. Now, this model sees communication as occurring in four fundamental steps, right? And for each of the four, you know, there are factors that will impact the outcome of the communication. So the four steps will reference a source, a medium through which the communication takes place, a channel through which um, it is received, and of course you have the receiver. Now, the source um, is the genesis and requires some amount of communication skills, right? They need attitude, knowledge, culture, and a social system. All of these are going to be elements that will impact the outcome of that which is delivered. Then you have the medium, right? And the medium, you know, in a, in a sense is impacted by content, other elements, the treatment of it, structure, code, etc. The channel oftentimes speak to our five um, senses, um, hearing, seeing, touching, smelling, and tasting. So that is, is seen as a channel based on the Berlow's model. And then, of course, the receiver. The receiver must have a similar type skills, um, communication skills, and, and um, the, the, the factors that will impact how the message is received is going to um, be a function of that receiver. You would have heard the term many a times that whenever one seeks to speak to an audience, one needs to assess the audience to ensure that the, 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 the interpretation levels of the audience, to ensure that the audience can understand what you are saying. Because there is a notion that suggests, right, um, the, an author, I don't remember the name of the author, that says communication is incomplete unless the recipient understands it. So if the person that you are communicating don't understand what you are saying, it doesn't matter how sophisticated you speak. It doesn't matter what is it that you communicate to them. It doesn't matter the content. If they do not understand it, you did not communicate. So it is very important that when we communicate, we understand that it must be packaged in such a way for the receiver to comprehend. Otherwise, communication would not have taken place. Then there is the Shannon Weaver model of communication. Again, this one, you have a sender and you have a receiver. Now, we had an experience of the Shannon Weaver model a short while ago, right? I was trying to communicate with you. You are the receiver, right? And someone left a line open with something that interrupted us in the channel, noise. So we were hearing noise of sorts, right? So what we just experienced, right? So here it is that I am using a medium to communicate with you, right? And so treatment is given to the encoder. We had some interruption, which is the noise that interrupted the channel of delivery. And then the information is being decoded, right? Remember that information that I am sending you is traveling via some medium um, to you through some telecommunication medium. Then when it gets to you, you have a device that is decoding what I am saying. And then you are receiving and interpreting the, inf in the information. Every now and again, somebody stops me to ask a pertinent question, right? That is feedback I am getting. But the mechanism for the feedback is the same as that wish I am using to send the information to you. So we just experienced the Shannon Weaver model of, um, of communication, and we're still um, experience, experiencing it. 
Now the fourth linear model that you are asked to understand is the Laswell's model. Now what Laswell, um, um, Laswell tries to answer some questions for us or in that communication methodology, that's what we try to do. By asking the questions, who says what, in which channel, to whom, and with what effect? So that's what the Laswell model seeks to answer for us. So when it is that we are operating in that dimension, we know that we're using the Laswell model. Let's move on to the interactive model. There are two ways, um, um, two, two types, right? So essentially the, in, the, the, the interactive models are best for explaining impersonal um, two-way communication processes. And the first we're gonna be looking at is the osgood Schramm model. And what this does, it promotes some level of reciprocity. It, it promotes um, equality. It is that model that sees um, both the, 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 the sender of the communication and the recipient as being on the same level. So we could say, hey, when we're communicating with our peers, we may not always use terminologies that everybody else will understand. I may not always use tone that everybody else will appreciate because we're talking to our peers. In essence, you are using the osgood Schramm model. Then there is the Wesley and the McLean model of communication. And this um, particular model suggests that communication is influenced by environmental, cultural, and personal factors. It is a very complex model that utilizes an algorithm to to evaluate the impact of the various externalities um, on the model. So yes, um, this is a very um, interesting model, one that we all use. And just think about your current environment where you are. Some persons are at home, and the manner, uh, the manner in which you will communicate now may not be the same as if you were um, on campus with your friends. So your environment is impacting how you communicate. If you are going to communicate to the group right now, the fact that you're in a group setting is going to influence how you communicate. If you are from a different country, from a different culture, um, you may understand that some things you do it at this time and some things you don't do it. For example, we were interrupted during the course of class in a short while ago to be asked a question that the average person should know you don't do at that time, right? So communication needs to also have an understanding of what is right from what is wrong and when we do things and when we don't do it. So all of these things impact the manner in which um, we um, communicate. And the last two of the, come on, come on. Yeah. Last two of the, of the eight, want to look at is uh, the transactional uh, models. And what they do, they explain direct personal communication processes where two-way feedback is immediate, right? Now, the first we want to look at is the, is the um, dances helical model, which depicts communication as an endless spiral of increasing complexity. And this, this um, was a model that was developed and, pre and presented by Tom Dance, right? So that's why it's called the Dance's Helical Model. Now, oftentimes we observe this. When persons are disingenuous, they don't want to answer questions or they don't want to disseminate information in a manner for you to understand. So they give you a lot of eye pollution and appear to be speaking to you and in a manner where they are endlessly speaking and you seem not to be understanding anything. The more they speak, the more complex the situation um, gets because, of course, they want to confuse you and they don't want to share the information. Or it may not be intended, but it turns out to be that way. Then there is the Barn Lunch transactional model, 
And what this does, it explores interpersonal immediate feedback com communication. An important element of this approach is the idea that feedback for the sender is essentially the reply for the receiver. And we can look at this and argue that this is a day-to-day -day conversation that we'll have with the average Joe. Also of importance um, to the Barn Loans transactional model is our own understanding that there are various factors that will influence what is it that we think and say. So as communicator, there are various factors that will impact the nature and character of the message that we will send. Also, the medium we use could experience various forms of, um, and this is done, um, being said contextually, various form of interferences to include noise in both directions. When the information is being sent to the receiver, and even the, the recipient's response, which will then be his reply um, to the original sender. And in the same manner, there are going to be various forms of influential factors in the formation and dissemination of the information from the recipient. So this explains your eight um, models and it's important, as I said um, before, you know, we, the eight is a, a linear model that we should um, fully appreciate what the linear model is all about. There are four of them that I shared with you just now. And I also shared two interactive models and two transactional models that you are expected um, to understand. I alluded to this um, a bit uh, earlier that we have informal um, written, which is your email and your memo. We have formal written communication models, which are things done in writing, your letters, your contracts, your project plan. Then we have informal verbal, and here is where we engage in meetings, conversation, phone calls, discussions, and of course, the formal verbal, which speaks to your speeches and presentations, etc. There are some videos that I am trying to upload on Moodle. I was um, um, hoping that I could upload them. I'm having some problems doing that. But I'd like for you to see these videos. What uh, they express to us is the importance of culture and verbal expressions, verbal and nonverbal expressions. So these videos are supposed to demonstrate to us how we can interpret correctly or incorrectly um, um, intended communication based on um, cultural differences and based, based on actions or inactions on the part of the person sending the message. So that's what these videos, they are very short videos. So when I do upload them, I'd like that you have a look at them to better appreciate particularly nonverbal communication and the second day culture. So let us look now at manage uh, communication. So when we think in project management terms of the management of communication, it's about managing what, what it does. It, it ensures um, timely and appropriate storage and collection, generation, and the distribution of project information to the right people at the right time. So this slide sums up what project communications management is all about, right? To so look at your inputs, your tools and techniques, and your output. So obviously you need a project management plan with its attendant documents as your input. And you're going to use either, you know, whatever communication skills you have and that comes in different forms and by way of um, your own communication competencies, your nonverbal communication uh, attributes, presentation skills, 
Uh, you're going to use various communication methods based on the stakeholder requirements. You're going to use various form of communication technology. And obviously, you must have some amount of interpersonal team um, skills for you to be able to, to demonstrate active listening, to be able to manage conflict, um, to show cultural awareness, um, et cetera. And the main output of this process is the project's communication. Not the project's communication plan, but communications itself, because the plan would have been done under 10.1. Right, so we can share information or communicate information, meetings, where we have hard copy documents. We can upload information using technology and and create a database where we store the information and give access to individual via a network electronic system. Uh, we can do it by way of the electronic media to include fax, email, voicemail, video conferencing, you name it, right? We can also use certain electronic project management tools like software. We have software that we can use. The prominent ones are Risky Project. We have, we have, um, Microsoft Project, we have Microsoft Excel. Those are three of the key um, project management tools that people are using these days to assist with managing um, projects. Now, next is project communication management, and this uh, is the process of monitoring and controlling communications throughout the entire project life cycle to ensure the information needs of project stakeholders are met. Now, whilst this is true, why, what is also of, of relevance and importance is that we are managing the information that we don't want to get out and that we are managing the people that we don't want to be communicating because we will always have some people on the project who feel that they are the best orators and the best communicators and they should be communicating. The problem is that some of them will also believe that they are a reservoir of information and they know how best to do it, when more often than not, they don't even have 10% of the information required to inform that which they communicate. And that's why it is important that the information be, um, the, the communications be properly planned, that it be properly managed, and that it is also properly controlled by the project manager and, and or his designate. So to look at this process, the inputs again are going to be many from the project management plan and to include your communications management plan and your issues log, lessons learned, etc. You're gonna need a project management um, information system to help you to, to collect and analyze, store, and has a capacity for you to retrieve and disseminate information. So you need that. You need internet, inter, interpersonal and team skills here as well. And the output, obviously, will be your work performance information. Now, supposing during the time of communication something happened, and a change request was made or the change to something was effectuated, then you need to ensure that whatever changes you make to your project, to the extent that it will impact the triple constraint of your project. Remember the triple constraints in project management, scope, cost, time. If any of those are going to be impacted, you have to raise a change request. And on raising that change request, um, you, you have that as an output for your monitor um, communications um, process. So we finished, um, we finished uh, project communications management. Those were the three processes that we needed to understand. Any questions? Go ahead, Etienne. Yes, sir. Um, earlier you mentioned um, email as nowadays being formal. 
and we're going back and forth between formal and informal. Before email, sir, what would be considered formal? In writing. Everything was written. Oh, okay, sir. Up until the mid nineties, remember that remember that um the internet was introduced in nineteen ninety two. Yes, I'm aware, some of you weren't born yet. But the internet was introduced in 1992. And it gained prominence, for example, in a country like Jamaica in about 1996. At that time, we didn't have a lot of access to like Hotmail and, and um, Outlook or Gmail or Yahoo, even up until 95, 96. In Jamaica, we had a company called N5. They were the prominent players in internet delivery um, in Jamaica. And then Cable and Wireless um, came on stream um, and, 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 and created a platform for mainly for businesses and stuff like that. But it was mainly N5 until the government had legislation to allow for the inclusion of um, other um, service providers such as the yahoos and the hotmails and the gmail then later came on and stuff like that but this is a relatively new phenomenon and even then most jurisdictions did not recognize email as with any formality it is only recently perhaps in the last 10 years that there is any recognition of email Whilst, whilst in a, any jurisdiction, when the courts, these things are normally driven by a court, when the court starts using an email as evidence of something, that is when it starts to gain formality. In Jamaica, there, as far as I'm aware, there's still no legislation that allows um, for us to acknowledge email as an official form of communication. So remember that project management in the main is going to be transboundary transnational so there's a lot of things that you might do on your project that will require parties external to jamaica now if they recognize if they recognize um, the email as being formal then that is good for you another thing that is being done is that you might still and and is as 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 a compromise for many jurisdictions what they have done you may you may write an email not an email, you may write a letter. Whilst you can get it signed, you can scan it and email it, and that is recognized as formal. Or if you can do it online, get a signature somehow on it and PDF it and send it by email, that too is recognized as formal. So more and more jurisdictions are recognizing this. More and more um, jurisdiction, um, jurisdictions are recognizing it um, to be to be, to be formal. So um, the, the, the question is still unanswered. The question is still unanswered in some jurisdictions, but in some it is recognized as, as being formal. Any other question? All right. Let us now move on to project scope management. So when we think of project scope management, we, we um, want to look at we want to look at the various processes. But today we are going to be looking at three main processes. And at the end, which is um, the next class, we want to be looking at, we want to spend some time on, invest some time on the work breakdown structure, which is a process um, in itself that requires some attention. So if you don't do anything else, ensure that for the next session, which I think is tomorrow, that you are present because um, we want to go through scope your, your major assignment, which is assignment number two, as a requirement for you to do a work breakdown structure for the project under consideration. So let us ensure that we we are at the next. Um, out. Go ahead, um, Trevon. Go ahead, Trevon. You might
might want to unmute your microphone. We're not hearing you. Okay. We're not hearing Trevon. So when we talk of scope management, what is this? It's about collecting the stakeholders' requirements. It's about understanding and documenting the scope. It's about breaking the scope down into manageable components. We have to recognize that this is a responsibility of the project manager to do because he has to plan and control the scope. Now, there's a distinction to be made between the project and the product scope. Both must be, um, sorry, sorry, both um, must be defined and documented, right? So with that understanding, let's move on to the next slide. And the first definition will be product scope. And when we think of product scope, what is that, right? Basically, the product scope speaks to the features and the functions that characterize a product, service, or a result. Then we, we, we can now look at the project scope project scope, which will speak to the work required to deliver the product, the service, or the result with the specified features and functions. So the product is the output. <clears throat> the project scope is that vast amount of activities or work required to deliver the product scope. So I want for us to leave here on understanding the difference between the product, the service, or the result, which is normally in project management terms referred to as product or output. And let us look at the project scope. The project is that coordination of the vast amount of activities that must be undertaken to give us that product with the features that the client or the customer or the stakeholders stipulate. It is important that we understand the concept of gold plating, that in project management, the agreed to deliverables are all that you are compelled to deliver. So you deliver only the scope that is required to produce the deliverable and nothing else. Even if you have excess material, even if you have excess this or that, and you give that to the customer, that is going to be called gold plating. That's not your job. Being kind is not your job in project management. Right? I saw a scenario, just to <clears throat> share this with you quickly, a scenario where where a project manager having completed the construction of a house had used premix to cast the top of the pit and premix had excess concrete. And he decided that he was going to cast an area that was about four meters, four meters by three meters. And he decided to just quickly box it up because it would create a nice patio for the customer, which was a lady who was living in England and coming back to Jamaica. And he said that would create a good patio for her. She did not ask him for that. The lady had engaged and a horticulturalist as well as some, some, some decor for garden to prepare her front yard to design her front yard, having sent, sent the entire drawing um, to them as to what the front yard would look at, like and the additional space. When she returned to Jamaica and she observed 
what was there. She went ballistic. The contractor, who was a project manager, had to go back. Based on where the concrete was, he had now put um, a fencing, the fence, a concrete fencing in, and the back oak could not access that area. He had to break down a piece of the wall for the back oak to get through to get into that area. He then had to, to put um, a jackhammer, to install a jackhammer on the back of that back hole to now break up that concrete, get trucks, pick up um, the, 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 the debris, dump it, rebuild the lady's wall at a cost to himself. Why? He thought he was doing good. He was gold plating. The customer did not ask you for that. You give nothing extra. There are many questions that will arise. There are many questions that will arise in a test. Go ahead, Sean. All right. Yes, sir. Um, I have two questions. All right. The fact that that was not in the original um, plan, it wasn't agreed upon initially. What if the contractor had made contact with her, you know, stating that, you know, they have leftover concrete um, and he has an idea of doing such? Would that still fall in that category? And the second question is, um, you spoke of it from the angle of, you know, the contractor doing something outside of, you know, what was agreed upon. But what if it's a case where, you know, there was a particular outline set already, but the customer wanted to make addition at the last minute, would that be still considered in, in, a, in a similar fashion? To answer the first um, question, you have no agreement um, with with the. Remember, in, in, we spoke to to seven project constraints, right? And one of them is customer satisfaction, that you want to satisfy the customer. So yes, at all times, the project manager seeks to satisfy the customer. The fact you have no agreement, right? And what I'm going to say now is irrelevant to the question, but but pertinent. When the contractor, because I'm familiar with the case, when the contractor was finished, it was way up in the evening, and they were pouring a lot of concrete on that day around the property. It was about um, seven o'clock in the evening. Seven o'clock Jamaica time at that time was one o'clock in the morning in England. So you wouldn't expect him to be calling the customer at that time, right? But even that, so I'm saying that is irrelevant because they shouldn't be expected to do that. Remember what we are discussing, or the topic we, are dis we discussed just before is communication. He had sufficient time. If it is that the house is finished, roof is on, interior is done, they are doing yard work, they are, they are, they are pouring concrete on, on septic tanks and covering pits and all of these things. It means that he had an entire project that lasted for nearly a year to communicate with um, the lady. He didn't do that. He didn't communicate well enough. So the bottom line is, as a project manager anyway, is to know that you don't gold plate, you give that which is delivered. How do you communicate it efficiently? And to answer the second part of your question, and there was agreement that she could do with a patio at the front or someplace else. Yes, he, he, he can do it. But that is a change request because remember, you know, it was not a part of the original scope. So if it is that you're going to change the scope, those things come at a cost. Those things come at a cost, you know. So he obviously did not do his measurement right, which is why he had so much excess concrete. He bought far too much concrete. Right? So there are many ways to look at it, but the safest thing to do as a project manager is to ensure that what you deliver is that which is agreed to with the customer. Nothing more, nothing less. And you will be safe. Anything outside of that, you're asking for trouble. What I didn't say, and since you have asked the question, let me expand on it a little bit. When the, 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 the situation I explained to you just now where the project manager had to get a backhoe, come back in, break down the ladies' perimeter fence, to include that perimeter fence had um, electrical wires running on top of it in, in conduits, hidden, 
So when he broke that down, he had to disconnect electricity, he had to re-engage his electrician to come back to rerun those things. All of those are wasted costs, wasted monies, because he has responsibility and liability. Now, when he went with that backhoe to break up that concrete, remember, as I said, it's a part to your right and connecting to the house. He could have damaged something on the house, you know. And just to let you know that the, the few inches that it was raised, obviously, is going to leave a discoloration. He had to go back with a mason to fix out that wall properly and repaint it. It cost him um, I'm quite a, a penny to do it. So he has um, liability should something happen. The liability resides with him, and he had responsibility, meaning that woman don't pay a cent. Um, she was inconvenienced for the moment that he was there doing all of that, but he brought it on himself by gold plating. You never do that. All right? Don't feel sorry for anybody and give extra. No baker's dozen. Don't, don't um, feel that you're kind. No, it will come back and bite you in the rear end. So you don't do that. All right? Let's move on. Come on, don't do this to me. All right, so we have defined product scope and project scope, right? But we have not fully defined um, what scope management is all about. But when I spoke to you about gold plating just now, gold plating or the definition is inherent in what scope management is because scope management by its nature embodies all the work required and only the work required for project success. So when we speak about scope management, that is where our focus should be. All the work required and only the work required for project success. Okay? When we think of project scope management, there are six processes. And if you notice, four of these processes are under the planning process group, whilst two are under the monitoring and control process group. We are going to be looking at three of them today. Plan scope management, collect requirements, and define scope. And these three we will do recognizing that in tomorrow's class, we want to spend a lot of time looking at create double base. Very important. So for those of you who have um, colleagues, um, group, group um, members, please ensure that they are at tomorrow's session. It's very important that they understand how we do this. So when we think of plan scope management, it's the process of creating a scope management plan. Go ahead, Trevor. Go ahead, Trevor. Unmute your mic, please. I don't know if it's me alone. Is anybody hearing um, Trevor? No, sir. Trevon, we're not hearing you. I think this is the second time. Something may be wrong with your microphone. You can send us a, me a message, Trevon. We're not hearing you. All right, so let's move on. All right, so let's move on. Um, Trevon, I didn't see your question and I don't want to see your question. Not unless today is your first day at class. Today is my first day, sir. I was having some issues with registration. Who is this, Nathan? 
Yes, sir. All right, Nathan, I'm going to answer you, but I'm not answering Trevon, okay? So it's unfortunate that you are late, Nathan. What happens is that we do not have, the university says that we must have 15 or more students um, in a class to have a class. Neither for Monday or Tuesday do we have sufficient students in the class. So what I've done, I have created on a Monday morning, we have agreed a Monday morning is when we are going to be having our lectures. And But if you notice how I structure the lectures, I try to make them interactive so that persons can ask questions as we go along. On a Tuesday, on a Thursday evening, but not all, we will also be having classes, which is when, which is when um, we engage in discussions. Um, we can, we can um, do some, some critical things. For example, like um, the session that I've blocked is from, is from um, six to nine on a Tuesday. But for tomorrow. I think it will be from 7.30 to 9. So please double check. As I said, when the class started, please check on Moodle, all the sessions. So all the sessions that you observe, you are expected to attend, right? We had already checked with most of the folks. There is no conflict, though there are some students that are scheduled for Thursday. So even for those that are not scheduled for Thursday, we are asking that provided you don't have a conflict, because it is more knowledge, it is more information. It's going through more information. And why I um, structure the course this way, some students may want to go and sit the PMI exam to become a PMP, a Certified Project Manager. It is a coveted um, title to have these days, right? So, so um, that's one of the main reasons why so what I'd like to find out, hold a while for me, please. Please hold a while. Right. So, so, uh, what, what we are trying to do, let, let me ask the question anyway. So Trevon, is there anybody online now, right now, that is scheduled to have a class on a Thursday evening? Is there anybody online? Sir, we have a class from, um, I think it's six to eight. That's one person. Anybody else online? Who has a class on a Thursday evening? So you yes, mean um, six to eight, five. When I say a class, project management. Is there anybody else online who has a class, a project management class on a Thursday evening? Oh, sir, no, we don't have no project management class on Thursday evening. We don't have no project management. We have a uh, other um class we say project management okay. around that time. all right so there, you are saying there is nobody online who has a class on thursday yes sir that's what we're saying all right so i know i know there's a list so perhaps none of them came to today's class so i will have to reach out to them individually all right so let me i'm gonna reorganize it then okay i'm gonna because really you don't need more than three hours for the week all right so for for these so i'm gonna separate it then that's fine so everybody who is here for the for the wednesday morning class just remain here you don't have to attend the thursday session i'll just focus the thursday session on those persons who are actually scheduled for thursday and may have a conflict with coming to this morning's class so since you are all scheduled for this hour right so with the class starts at eight Right. If you notice, I always put um, the classes for schedule it for two and a half because Moodle will not allow us to schedule for more than um, two and a half hours. OK, but the class should really be from from eight to eleven. But what we will try to do is um, to pack all the information in the two and a half hours. All right. 
So let's move on. So it's okay, um, um, guys, don't worry about the Thursday class. I will reach out to that group and see how we manage that. But I know they are not 15. That's the problem I'm having. But we, we'll, we'll work that out. All right. All right, good. So plan scope management. The key benefit we should leave your understanding of this process is that it provides guidance and direction on how scope will be managed throughout the project, all right? So that has to, that essentially is the plan. Okay, I have again um, kicked off. Is that what has happened? Okay. So for scope, the, the scope management plan, this is one of those processes that is done very early right it's done very early um and what we need is a project charter and we need a quality management plan and we need a number of other um, elements but we need importantly expert judgment we will have to do some data analysis uh, as a part of the technique in determining uh, how we plan our scope and at the end of the day, we will have two things. The output from the plan scope management process is the requirements management plan. And secondly, the scope management plan. It's very important that we retain this information. One of the most important processes that we will be called upon to undertake is this one, collect requirements. And this is a process of determining in the first instance documenting in the second instance and managing stakeholder needs in the third instance and the fourth instance the requirements to meet the project objective this is very important to understand that if you don't carefully carry out the collect requirements process we will not be able to properly define scope if you don't properly define scope 5.4, which we are going to do next class, not, not tomorrow anymore, but next class, which next week this time, we are going to be doing the WBS. It is so important. If you don't do collect requirements well, you cannot do WBS on your WBS well. So it's important that you focus attention on how you collect requirements. All right? Um, the project su success is going to be directly influenced by stakeholder involvement and at what level at the very early stage when they can aid in the decomposition of the respective needs of the stakeholders into requirements very important so this happens very early because as i said before the success of your project is going to be heavily dependent and the inputs and the inputs are going to come from the collect requirements process okay so let's look um, in brief at what is required to start this process all the documents that you can think of that you will have at that early stage but an important element remember when we discuss eef and opa which is your enterprise environmental factors and your organizational process assets we said that we will be using information that would have been stored from former projects and historical data to help to shape what we do here is where you're going to go back to that now right based on what you have in the organization to use that to help you in determining how and some of it is cultural how is it that i go about to collect the requirements they may already have a form that you use you understand? So you have to, in determining how to scope your project, go back to base one to see what is there, how they expect you to do things. It doesn't mean that if you are new to the company, you can modify what is existing. But of importance also is to recognize that a project manager now needs to have a wide array of understanding. The expert judgment that we speak about is going to do data gathering. How do I gather the data? Now, there is no one formula for any project, right? So there are multiplicity of things that you may be called upon to do. 
by applying different tools and techniques, many of which are listed here. And of course, the output of the college requirements process will be the requirements documentation, not the requirements document, documentation, which in itself is a process, not a physical output. The physical output is going to be the requirements traceability matrix. That is a document. So please do not confuse both. Okay? So when we talk about requirements documentation, it's actually the process of documenting the requirements. So that is perceived to be an output. And secondly, your requirements traceability matrix. But don't get flustered by that. So here, for example, is a sample of a requirements traceability matrix, right? So it is telling you, um, the, the, it gives you descriptors and, and that we can describe. And if you, it's self-explanatory. Then it outlines for you the various areas for which you need to capture data that will then translate. And these requirements will translate into activities that will eventually produce an output. So it's a grid that links product requirements from their origin, the origin meaning the stakeholders that may, they might tell you something and you, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but you as a project manager have to pick the sense out of the nonsense. And when you finish picking the sense out of the nonsense, you go back to them and say, my interpretation is this. And they say, yes, 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 that's the output. So you put it right. So because sometimes people don't know what they want and that's a reality. So when you talk to them or you have members of your team talk to them, you need to go back and validate when you put it in project management terms or in engineering terms to ensure that they understand that this is what your output would look like. You don't want a scenario where the lady um, asked her to build a house and she wanted her bedroom to be 15 by 15, but you made it five by five. Why? Because you don't understand what 15 by 15 looks like. So you sometimes have to take that stakeholder, if you are suspicious that they may not understand what they want, you take them on a journey to ensure that they understand. So the requirements traceability matrix as well is in part set up to help to ensure that each requirement adds some value. If it's a business, it is adding business value by linking it to the business and the project ob objectives. In, in furtherance, it provides a means to track requirements throughout the project life cycle helping to ensure that requirements approved in the requirements documentation are delivered at the end of the project. So this is, so, is a document that helps you to ensure that that is done, okay? It provides a structure for managing changes to um, the product scope. So this requirements traceability uh, matrix is a very important tool to use, all right? The next one that I want to look at is how we define, how we define um, project scope. And what is define um, project scope? It's a process of developing a detailed description of the project and a product. Yeah, as simple as that. It's a process of developing a detailed description of the project and product. Now let's look at this. If you notice your assignment number two for those groups that have already started, you're asked to do a scope baseline. A scope baseline requires three elements. You have to do what is called a project scope statement. You have to do a WBS, which we will be doing next class and you have to do a WBS dictionary, okay? Now, the input into the, into the defined scope process is your project chart and your project management plan. But then you have to apply some expert judgment and do some data analysis. You have to have good interpersonal and team um, um, skills because you have to be able to facilitate. You have to be able to analyze the product. That means when somebody comes and tells you something in isolation, as a project team member or as a project manager, you have to go and make the sense out of the nonsense, as I said. 
And when you understand what this output is, remember that the output of your project can be a product, a service, or a result. When you understand what it looks like, and that is why architects, not only will they draw because they can visualize three dimensionally what a building looks like, but you want everybody else who can visualize the thing three dimensionally, you want them to see what it looks like. Nowadays with the advancement in technology, we are doing some 3D renditioning. We can create a video and you look inside and you show them inside and create some dummy men walking up and down inside and outside of the building and you say to them, this is what it will look like. That's the reason you do it, because sometimes they know they want something that they don't always know exactly what they want. So you have to be there to ensure that you can deliver to them or show them what is it that they want. So at the end of the defined score process, what do we have? A project scope statement. Yeah? So now, what I don't want us to confuse the project charter with the project scope statement. These are two separate things, okay? So let's look at them side by side. We already went through the project charter. We are doing our first individual assignment is doing a project charter. So we already know what the project charter and what is required of us for the project charter. But let's look at the project scope statement, which is a requirement of the first part of assignment number two. So basically, you are giving project scope description. What are the things that you now need to do in a progressively and um, elaborative and deliberate way to ensure the success of your project? So in brief, and this is a very brief document, okay? Your scope statement typically can be written in a few sentences for a small project like you are going to do. When I say a few sentences, no more than half a page. You give some description and I, there's a template that I have distributed. You just use that template. It's a one pager, okay? So you need to state what your project deliverables are. You need to state what the acceptance criteria um, is or are and you indicate the project exclusions. So let me give you an example because somebody sent me an email to ask me what is a project exclusion. So supposing, so in your scope statement, supposing your project is about the repurposing of an existing building for something new. So you have a building that is being used as, as um, a storeroom. You want to repurpose that building to become, to become a training room. So the repurposing, the scope will entail the clearance of the building. The scope will entail renovation to the building and you describe what renovation entails and it will also include um, the installation of air conditioning units um, to comfort for X amount of people. It will also include the installation of um, security, security implements such as cameras, um, a, a buzzer, um, entry door or, or um, a swipe car door, whatever it is you describe what it should look like. So if you tell them that you want um, an electronic entrance door that will people will have their individual electronic um, cards. They can't give you a door with key. You stated specifically what you wanted, right? Now, what are the exclusions for this project? The, the, this this um, scope of work for this contractor, and you put as an exclusion furnishings, blinds. So that contractor is not responsible for carrying blinds and put at the windows because you're going to get a next contractor to do that. You put as an exclusion furniture. You don't want this particular contractor to, to procure and install furniture because you're going to get another company that specializes in furniture to do that. So everybody understand what exclusions are now? So 
acceptance criteria, you can develop a document. So acceptance for me means A, B, C, D. So we are going to do an inspection when the project is completed. And for us, acceptance means that you have carried out the full scope as agreed to in the contract. You would have gone through the scope and they've done everything. So that is what acceptance means. In addition to that, in addition to that, acceptance means that the correct colors as outlined in the scope were used to paint the building. Acceptance means that at high noon or at one o'clock on a very sunny day, on a very sunny day, and this has to be a day during during the period when the project is being undertaken. The temperature as measured inside the building, remember that part of the scope is to put in AC, must be, and you can say with X amount of persons inside the building, the temperature must be at, at um, 20 degrees Celsius, because you will anticipate that when you put more people in the building, the, um, the temperature going to increase. So these are some of the acceptance criteria that you can include in the project scope statement. You can speak to quality as well when you define the scope. Remember earlier, we said that one of the inputs would be some quality document. So you state these things so that at the time of acceptance of your project, you will then go through the list of things that you agree to in the project scope statement to ensure that the contractor meets them. If not, you are not prepared to accept the project. Any questions? Everybody understand me so far? Okay, great. So now let's move on. So now that we understand what is required for our project scope statement, we earlier understood what was required for a project charter. I rather suspect that most persons are close to completing their project charter now because, because um, this has been long given over three weeks ago. Now, when we talk about scope definition, we need to ensure that when we collect our requirements and we define the scope, that we re-engage the key stakeholders to ensure that they fully understand how you interpret the scope to be, that they fully understand how you interpret the outputs to be, so that when you deliver the outputs, you are in full alignment with their understanding as well. So you need to ensure that this is done. Now, when you do this, it reduces the probability of you having what is called a scope the last thing you want on your project is a scope creep. You will recall um, I said that next class we are going to invest some time in the WBS. We are investing the time in the WBS mainly because most projects experience scope creep because they did not invest time in the WBS and the WBS dictionary. And the key stakeholders that are empowered to change the scope may not have fully understood the nature of the scope. So you want to ensure that this does not happen by you fully and unambiguously defining the scope, sharing it with the key stakeholders, and ensure that you have sign off. So that halfway through the project, they don't come and tell you that, hey, I need to add this or I need to do this. Because remember when we looked at the triple constraints in project management, we said that any one of the triple constraints that is changed will likely impact the other two and quite likely impacting quality as well. So we said if scope is changed, quite likely it will change the cost of the project. So that means two baselines are already changed. In addition to that, if I change scope, it will likely impact my schedule. So a third baseline is changed. And on all projects, you are going to have three baselines that you want to hold on to. You don't want to change any of them. Otherwise, it is going to be deemed 
has impacted project management or poor project management. You don't want that. In addition to that, in addition to that, the scope creep, right, could be caused, um, in a moment you can ask a question, the scope creep is seen not only as you um, um, changing an element, but that change can be occasioned because you're adding features and or functionalities to the product scope without assessing the effects of the project constraints. And this quite likely would have been done um, because it was not done earlier in the day. And so the project manager, it is very important for that project manager to be sufficiently knowledgeable so that when you understand what the product service or result should be, that is the output of the project, that you say to them, hey, I know that this is what you say you want, but there are some other alternatives. Would you consider A, B, or C as the output as well to ensure that they are aware before you start the project of other features and functionalities that they could add because you don't want it to negatively impact your project? Go ahead with that question, please. Somebody had a question just now? No, sir. Good, sir. My bad. Okay. All right. So here's where um, we stop today because I don't want um, WBS is our next um, is our next topic. I don't want to start it because it is so involved and break. I need for that era to be um, to, to to get some time. So I want to break um, here. Um, there's a video. There's a video that I, it's one of the, the four or five videos that I'm trying to upload onto Moodle for you to look at what scope creep really is and the impact it will have on your project, uh, negative impact that is it will have on your project. So it behoves us all to ensure that we fully define our project before or the scope of our project before we start the project so that we don't experience any scope creep, which will essentially change um, any or all of our triple constraints. And if that happens, nine out of 10 times, it impacts the quality of the output as well. We don't want that. Any questions? Okay. What I would like to do at this time is for us to complete the formation of the groups. So let me just do some housekeeping. For those persons who just joined us late, that is unfortunate. Because we have some timelines, and let me just pause for a moment and bring that slide up for your benefit. I know sometimes it's not your fault why you're late. I know the university at times may have challenges, so I am not ignorant to that, and that's one of the reasons I will, I will, uh, where is it, where is it, where is it? I will facilitate your understanding as to how this course is structured. So, particularly for those persons who are, Christ, no, not this, not this, not this, sorry. Just a moment. Upload. It's not uploading. Okay. Are, are you still hearing me? Because my screen is frozen. Yes, sir. All right. So I was hoping to share something with you, but um, I suppose the reason why you are here, um, you are on Moodle, is because you have access. You, you are on this this uh, session today is because you have access to Moodle. All the lectures are already uploaded on Moodle. For those persons who are new or for those persons who are online that are not new but didn't get the information before, either because they didn't care to, 
or because they weren't listening. In lecture number one, lecture number one, on the slides nine and ten, the course delivery plan is outlaid there. You have some assignments. So let me just explain to the persons who are new. There are five, there are five um, assessments that will be done for this course. You will have two tests. Each test carries 20 marks. You have an assignment that is already issued that is due, I think, on the 10th. And that date, because you're late, will not change, okay? So that means you have a week to do um, your first assignment. The assignment is posted on Moodle. It is comprised of two parts. You would have heard me speaking about a project charter. So you are required to do a project charter and a stakeholder analysis. The project charter should take you no more than four to five hours. If you are focused on what you're doing, the stakeholder analysis should take you no more than two hours. You have to select a project and develop a project charter and a stakeholder analysis. The good thing for you is that for both the project charter and the stakeholder analysis, all you need to do is a template. The, template. the templates are already posted on Moodle. So if you go on Moodle, everything I'm telling you is already there. So whilst you read the assignment, the assignment will explain to you what to do and the templates are there, okay? You have a test on the 17th of February. So I'm asking persons to please re-engage the um, lecture number one and slides nine and 10 have outlined for you the course delivery. Everything is there. So you have your first assignment due on February 10, and there's a link on Moodle for you to upload the assignment. And I think the cutoff is 11.55 on the day of February. Um, February 10. You also have a test, as I said, on February 17 for those who are late. All the lectures so far to include today's lecture is already uploaded on a Moodle for you to prepare for your test. All other assignments. So your third assignment, not third, your second assignment is for you to develop a scope baseline. That assignment is already posted on Moodle and you're supposed to form a group. So please proceed to form the group. That group is what you will engage in to do both assignments two and three. So for assignment one, it's individual, but assignments two and three, and just to tell, tell you for those who are late, assignment two is due on, on March 10. So that's less, that's just over a month from now, is due on March 10. And assignment three, assignment three is due on March 31. Okay? So that's call it two months from now. So you have some pressure for those who are new to do assignment one, which is an individual assignment. But for the group assignments, please proceed to complete the formation of the groups so that you can deliver on your assignments without any problems. Okay, go ahead, um, Romain. I'm sorry you mentioned that the first assignment is due on the 10th, but um, when I checked it, I saw the 6th, which would be this Saturday, for the delivery, for the due date. Well, I don't know. Um, let me just double check here. Double check. When, if we have classes, we're in February, right? If we have classes on the 10th, it would be a class day. So I don't know why the 6th would be there. The assignment, I just need to double check on Moodle later. But I'm looking at what I uploaded on Moodle, right? All right. Um, so 
All right, so any other question pertaining to the class? Um, Trevon, I, I, um, I think I answered your question more than twice already, so please let us move on. Sir. Any other question? Sir, I have a question relating to the group. Because asking from before the class, sir, um, I keep asking people if their groups are full, sir. They keep telling me that I have to talk to you and you will put me in a group because that's what you're telling them to do. Okay. Well, um, if, if there is a group, what you can do is shoot me an email. Shoot me an email. Sir, I'm in a group either, you know. So you could have just met the group there right now, you know. Yes, sir. Who is that? Who was that just now? J, sir. Vibes. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, to give me better language than that. And and in this program. Yeah. Better than that, sir. I hope that, right? sir. Yes, yes, sir. So please use the opportunity to form the groups now, as J is suggesting. Otherwise, is, um, people are correct. If you're not in a group, I'm going to put you in a group and then and don't come and complain. So, sir, when, when we form that group, should we um, email it with who is in that group? Yes. Form the group and send me, select amongst yourself at a team leader and have that person send me the group with your ID numbers as well. Okay? All right, sir. Are there any other questions? There being no other questions, I expect to have those groups later today. And um, please finalize your, you should be at this stage now where you have a draft for your first assignment. You should be finalizing that now, all right? Any other questions? There being no other questions, have a blessed day. Cheers. All right, sir. Have a good one, too.